Assalamu alaikum everyone, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy Purizada. Thank you so much, Dr. Asif Mahmood. Um, I must thank you for uh, giving me this platform to speak. I must also thank Asif and uh, Ryan Grimm um, and all of you. Uh, it is a true honor to be speaking here today at the National Press Club and uh, to be able to share what I saw with my own eyes in Pakistan. Um, and uh, just to give you a little bit of background, I've been very uh, involved and passionate in the politics of South Asia for perhaps the last decade or so. I've been teaching this subject um, at the University of Oxford um, and I moved to the US uh, a couple of years ago. So I've been, uh, I guess, uh, a keen student and a keen learner of what happens in Pakistan, what happens in India. Um, and um, I now also, of course, do my own vlogging. Uh, but I went as an election observer in February in Pakistan. This is something I had in my mind when we got the election schedule. I thought I would love to go and see what happens, how is an election in Pakistan conducted, um, and to be able to see it for myself on the ground. So I went with an, uh, with an organization here in the US, uh, for which according to their policy, I cannot mention their name. But when I was in Pakistan, so I went at the beginning of February, just about a week before the election, and I was working with uh, the Free and Fair Election Network in Pakistan, the FAFIN, as we call them FAFIN, um, before we went. Um, so uh, just to tell you a little bit about the observation, it's a long-term long observation method that we followed. Um, so we were not looking at just the election day, but we were looking at uh, I would say three stages. So the election we were taught, and this is this was a part of our training, is not just the polling day, but is pre-election, polling day, and post-election. And so we started making notes, I would say, from December, um, and we uh, when the election schedule was announced. One of the things we noted was when the election schedule was announced, it um, it became quite clear that the, the mood of the country you know, it was great that, yes, we finally have an election coming up, but um, the way that the nomination papers were submitted, um, the, the candidates who submitted their nomination papers, not all of them had a free and fair chance to submitting. Uh, they were subject to torture, they were subject to, their families were being uh, subject to targeting. Um, and I would say this became a, a clear later on that there was perhaps one party that was facing this. But interestingly, there were other parties who were also facing this. So this is when I went to Pakistan and I spoke to some of the people on the ground. Um, it wasn't just uh, the party with Imran Khan, PTI. The PPP also complained and said, oh, you know, we also have our uh, posters are being pulled down in Karachi. The MQM is challenging and they're burning down our offices. And, uh, you know, they, they've, uh, so it, it, came, it became, that was very interesting for me that it wasn't just one party, which I thought before going to Pakistan that actually, you know, we can see that they're not being uh, given a level playing field, but it was more than just that. Um, so this was the pre-polling process. It, it, there were challenges um, and there were uh, definitely, there was, you know, I would say, thuggish behavior um, against independence and, um, and, and ransacking of their offices in the lead up to the election. So if you are supporting Imran Khan and you are uh, standing up in the election, that it became quite clear that uh, it, it wasn't going to be an easy road. Um, and this was a, a form of suppression, um, a voter suppression. And when I went to Pakistan a week before then, we had some more training there that was given to us by Fafin. And this is the largest network of civil society organizations in Pakistan, Fafin, and they do an excellent job. I have to give the credit to them that they trained us so well with so much sincerity. Uh, we had a full day of training where we, you know, we had a manual that we, we went through uh, extensively, and our training uh, covered each aspect of polling day. Uh, so from the morning till actually the votes were being counted. So we did the training and then on election day, let's get to <laughs> the exciting part, you know, this is, I was at, uh, so I was based in Lahore and I looked at four polling stations um, and uh, in a remote area called Fatehgarh. Um, it was very difficult to get to, but you know, they gave us transport. And I was there from 7.30 a.m. pre-polling. We, we had to see how the ballot boxes are sealed or not, etc. So I saw all of that. They were sealed. Everything seemed like, well, you know, this is... Uh, what I noticed was that there was definitely, um, you know, uh, in terms of the facilities and the, in the, the equipment that 
the election officials had was very basic. Um, things like you know not having enough staplers, etc. So I we noticed all of those challenges, and they were sitting on cold benches the whole day and with no breaks. Um, what I saw was that the election officials were so hardworking and worked with so much sincerity throughout the day. And I was trying to look for irregularities. I was trying to look at where is the rigging, but it became very clear from <coughs> eight o'clock on the election day when the internet and the phone signals were were, were gone. And first, we didn't really understand what was going on because, of course, the day before, you know, uh, we had been told that this would not happen. Um, so everyone was like, well, we, we can't speak. To, even the election officials were really struggling. So this wasn't just the voters, but they couldn't speak to their families. And, and they had actually been on this, uh, you know, for the day before when they had to collect the election materials. So they had been, a lot of the, them had not had enough sleep. Uh, you know, so it, and, and we thought, okay, well, eventually this will come back, the phone signals will come back, but they didn't come back the whole day. Um, and I think, and so I had four polling stations, and how did I find my next one? Even that was a challenge because I didn't have Google Maps, and I was in a remote area. So, um, and I thought these are my challenges, but I will tell you the story of Rabia at the end, who was one of the, a very inspirational voter for me. Um, but I will keep her story to the end. So we you know, carried on with the day, the ballot boxes were sealed. Shortly after eight o'clock, voters started coming in, started voting, um, and uh, the day went on, and I interviewed many different people, presiding officers, um, uh, you know, uh, polling officers, um, but what I noticed was that there was a delay, and some, in, in one of the polling stations I was in, we had four different uh, polling stations, but two of them were closed, and I didn't know why. Why, would, why were they being closed? And later on, as I saw that actually, now there were uh, longer queues in the other two polling stations. So the, this was perhaps, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's a tactic, but this was, this was something that I observed as slowing down the process of voting. So what, we, what I saw was long queues outside the two polling stations in that building. Um, and this happened, and I heard uh, from the other observers later on that this was something which was not just in my polling station, but in others as well. That they were so. If you you know if you just decrease the supply, there's more demand. So there was long queues outside, and not many not many people were not being able to vote because of this. So this was a way of slowing down the voting process um, and uh, delaying the polling. It also IDs. This is another thing I noticed when voters were coming in with their IDs. A lot of them were certain uh, IDs were not being accepted, um, and voters were being turned back. Uh, presiding officers and election officers, the way they were treating the elderly voters, and I really felt this was a form of voter harassment uh, because there was, you know, the, the and, I, and I've never seen so many uh, elderly people uh, vote like this in Pakistan's elections before. They were coming without any help and uh, they were coming in and asking the presiding officer, so how do I vote? And of course, as we, we know, that it was, this was a very difficult uh, situation with so many symbols, especially uh, for PTI. Um, and the presiding officer was, was, was very rude to, to these elderly voters and, and almost inhumane behavior that you should have brought a helper with you, I cannot help you. I can, and technically presiding officers or any election official cannot help you vote. But that doesn't mean that you treat these people like animals. You, you know, I, I really felt like this is, I, I saw a lack of kindness in the in the behavior of the election officials, um, and I thought this is not the training that they should have been provided. Um, if people are trying to vote, please help them vote. A vote, uh, an election should give access to people and not uh, not put them off. Um, um, and and so and this was very disturbing for me to see the way that these elderly uh, uh, voters were being treated. Um, and <coughs> the day went on and. Uh, it was, you know, until 11, and we, so I went to four different polling stations and in the last one that I went to, I saw the vote counting as well, which was, uh, which was, you know, which again, I have to say, in front of me, this was the Form 45 that was being produced in NA 1 to 1, and I saw all the votes for the different parties being counted, and it looked absolutely fine. And I thought, well, you know, where is the ringing? This is, and I remember I thinking like, uh, this is what what is everyone talking about? You know, they're actually they opened up the boxes, the, the they first closed the doors. The security we had security inside, all the polling agents. And by the way, there were so many polling agents for PTI. I you know this is one of the other things which I maybe this is 
a myth I want to dispel, this this one thing that polling agents perhaps of PTI were not allowed, at least in the ones that where the polling stations I were, they most of the polling agents were for the independents PTI. Um, so they were full of passion and lots of drive. Um, and so eventually around 10.30 p.m., you know, the votes, they started counting the votes, the presiding officer, and uh, one by one. Um, and uh, and I even made her recount one of the, the, the rounds, and I said, I think you've made a mistake. I just wanted to also challenge to see if, if they actually listened to us. And she did, and she recounted it in front of me. And I, and I remember thinking, this is, I'm satisfied with this. I'm satisfied with the way the vote counting is done um, now. And, and she was very, very, very meticulous and followed all the processes, um, perhaps a little bit inefficient. But, uh, you know, this was at 11 p.m. We got the Form 45. We walked out of the polling station. Um, and uh, and, and the, but there, were, there were lots of young men outside who were saying, can you tell us the result, who, who won? And I showed them my Form 45 and I said PTI. That was the NA 121 and there was a huge celebration. Um, but this is, this is only until 11 p.m. And I want, to, um, I want to go back actually to Rabia's story, which I mentioned, <coughs> and then I will come on to the post polling. Around 5 p.m., which is when polling time stopped, I was just coming out of the, the gate to, to get something. And, uh, and, and there, were, there was still a queue of people who I, I, who I explained because of this delay in the voting process, couldn't vote. But there was this one girl who really caught my attention. Um, and she saw that I had an ECP pass, so she said, uh, you know, can you please let me in? And I said, well, it's, it's 5.20 now, the voting is closed. Um, and she said, please, and you know, almost, <coughs> almost to the point that she was begging, and, and even the guards in the gate said, can you please take her in somehow? Just, and I said, I have to go and ask the presiding officer. This is not, not my authority as an election observer to let you in. So I went back and I spoke to the presiding officer um, and uh, she said, okay, let her come in. Uh, but you know, if I hadn't gone out that, and that girl actually, she started crying in front of me and she said, please let me vote. And I've, I've never seen this kind of sentiment. And even the guard said, look, you know, she, <laughs> she's an absolute, she's, she's crying, please let her in. I, I, she was so sentimental and she said, I don't know why they allocated this polling station to me because she said, I, I don't have anyone who lives in this area. Just a day before the election, they changed my polling station. Um, and this happened to a lot of voters where they were designated one polling station but a few days before they were changed. Um, and then she said, and I, she said, you don't know how I came here. I, I left my house at 11 a.m. and now I get here at 5.20 p.m. because there, was, there were no Google Maps. And she said that they've put me in this remote area. How am I supposed to come here? And she said, I dropped my two sisters off in the morning to their polling stations, and now I've just asked people and I've found my way here. And that really touched my heart, and I thought, like, and it means so much to her, you know. There were other voters who couldn't vote, but they were just like, okay, we can't vote. But she, she, she just started crying, and she had tears in her eyes. And I, and I took her inside, and, you know, the presiding officer thankfully said yes, and that girl, <laughs> was in the queue and she was the last one to vote in that polling station and I asked her who did you vote for and she said Imran Khan for oh. PTI. <laughs> I mean I you know I think this this kind of voice um, that's the biggest success that I as an observer saw that the mandate the people came out despite all the struggles and actually I realized oh my god actually yes not having the internet means you can't have Google Maps and all these people who, she made the effort and she made she had the courage and she was a young girl you know, probably in her late 20s or 30s. But what about the elderly people? What about the disabled people? And, um, uh, you know, so <laughs> and she had a car, she had transport, she could somehow do this, but there must be so many people who could not have voted because of, of not having the internet. But what I, and also when people were voting, as an observer, I was also asking some of the, you know, I was interviewing the people who were voting and, and some of, uh, a lot of people said, I'm sorry, I don't want to tell you who I voted for. And I said, why? She said, I'm scared. And you know, a lot of people were scared to tell me who they voted for. And I, and I can guess who, who, they, who they must have voted for. And they didn't want to tell because of security reasons. Um, but Rabia's story really sticks out to me. And then after the election, and a few days later, I messaged her and I said, so are you happy? PTI with the independence <laughs> of the majority. She said, well, my vote got wasted because the, the mandate is stolen. And she said, well, what's the point? Why, why did I make so much effort? Because look what's happening now. And I, and I said, no, I think what you did was absolutely right. You came out and voted. And the people coming out and voting is a huge result in itself. Um, and of course, after the election, uh, so I went home. I got home at 11.30. And, and there was, and now, and I, and, and I came home and I was really trying to ponder and think, 
So where was the regain? I, I didn't see it. But, you know, it's not that simple. Of course, if we look at the pre-polling and if we look at the internet and the, uh, and, and the phone signals being blocked, that's a huge denial of the free and fair information to people. So one yes. quick question, you know, yes. you observed one polling station, which would probably four. have four polling stations. Mm -hmm. you know, the, fi the final result of the polling stations. Yes. Did you follow up what happened to that particular polling station's final result subsequently? Yes, that in NA121, um, uh, we, so we were not allowed to go to the RO's office. Yes, so we did. We, I, as an observer, didn't know what happened in that RO's office. Yes. In the finalization of the form forty-seven, you were not allowed to watch that. No, no, no. We watched form forty-five being produced in front of our, of our eyes, and then the, pol the presiding officer would then take that huge sack, and you know, and they and they they put you know they they seal it so well with a candle and everything, and you think well. Where is it? But they are so skilled, of course. And she, she, she took all of that and then she went around, I would say, at 1 a.m. to the RO's office. And then we started hearing stories of what was happening. And, and, and then I saw this. And a lot of election observers uh, tried to go to the RO's offices but were not allowed. Fafin's observers were not allowed in our RO's offices. This is, uh, you know, in Islamabad. Uh, uh, but I was in Lahore. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so I think this is, uh, you know, I, and post polling, I think uh, the investigation that has been happening in terms of uh, electoral fraud um, and investigating, uh, you know, the, the stolen vote. Uh, so our post polling observations are that um, there hasn't been a sufficient response by the ECP, by the Election Commission of Pakistan, um, and uh, how long will it take for these cases to be actually resolved? Is, is another question because as we saw in previous elections it can take years so I think you know I think the sentiment that I really felt on the ground was that people were very passionate for the first time in my life I've seen this that people have been so passionate to vote um, but the human rights abuses the voter suppression they have fueled negative sentiments and a sense of well, you know, a demoralization. Um, so I think people are demanding a return of the, of the mandate of their of their rightful representatives. Um, and, and I just want to leave that story of Rabia with all of you. This is, you know, somebody who, who despite all the obstacles, uh, still came out to vote. And I think um, in all of the election observation, what I, what I noticed is that, yes, people on the ground are working very hard, but perhaps there are bigger forces or factors or powers that <coughs> have not uh, uh, led to a free and fair uh, election. And also lastly, this is uh, perhaps, it's not the official statement of Fafin, my observation, these are my own personal experiences. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs> thank you. Let me go to the end yes. because...